Excellencies, distinguished delegates, participants, and dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zones. And welcome to FAO in Geneva Agriculture Trade Talk session today, the first series of this year. My name is Pnar Karakaya. I am working as an economist at FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. And today I will be moderating the session. At the outset, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to attend our webinar today, given your busy schedules. We appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work. Before starting our event, let me share some details regarding the logistics and um, housekeeping issues for this virtual session. This webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will later be available on our website along with various related resources relevant to the session. It is scheduled to last about one hour and 15 minutes. We have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for question and answer session. Please submit your questions in the Q&A module, not in the regular chat box. While posting your questions, please kindly state your name and organization or institution. We will try to accommodate as many requests as possible, either in writing or oral during the webinar. If you have any problems or technical issues, please send a message in the chat box to ask for support. That's all for housekeeping issues. Now I would like to take a moment to give a brief information on FAO in Geneva Agriculture Trade Talks. As you would already know, FAO supports its members' efforts to formulate trade policies that are conducive to improved food security by strengthening evidence and analysis, providing capacity development, and facilitating a neutral dialogue away from the negotiating table. In this spirit, we have been organizing FAO in Geneva agricultural trade talks with a view to share information on relevant and timely topics at the intersection of trade and agriculture. These trade talks are based on an approach we call three I's, informal, interactive, and inspirational. Excellencies, uh, dear participants and dear colleagues, Today, we will focus on digitalization and agriculture. This session will enable diverse group of panelists, including the digital agriculture specialists and technology innovators to discuss the role of digitalization in contributing to more economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable agriculture. It will examine some of the opportunities as well as the associated challenges. We will also listen to experts' views with a focus on African region, on the youth and technology, and on the role of the youth in the sustainable agriculture agenda. Today's session will also provide an opportunity for the winners of the FAO Geneva Trade Platform Hackathon, Imagining Apps for Sustainable Agriculture, held on the 17th of November 2022, to present the application they designed. This hackathon showcased how youth can contribute to transforming agriculture to become more sustainable and resilient through digital transformation. Further information on this event can be accessed through our website. Before proceeding with the session, I would also like to introduce today's topic. Throughout the ages, technolo technological change in agri-food systems and elsewhere has brought gains in productivity, incomes, and human well-being. Today, technological solutions are indispensable to contribute to feed a continuously growing population in the face of limited agricultural land, unsustainable natural resource use, and increasing shocks and stresses, including climate change. These solutions are needed to support the transformation of agri-food systems to make them more resilient, inclusive, sustainable, and efficient, leaving no one behind. Digitalization in agriculture presents many opportunities. It can raise productivity, it can provide better working conditions and improved incomes and reduce the workload of farming, and it can generate new rural entrepreneurial opportunities. On the other hand, it can also pose various challenges. With this background, I would like to introduce our speakers. Mr. Tambani Malapela, Knowledge and Information Management Officer from the Office of Innovation at FAO. Mr. Ken Lohento, Digital Agriculture and Strategy Focal Point from FAO Regional Office for Africa, Mr. Caesar Woolley, Youth Employment Specialist from FAO Regional Office for Africa, Mr. Mo Safab, Heads of Sales and Data Success at Eggflow in Geneva, and the winning team of the FAO Geneva Trade Platform, Hackathon composed of Maximilian Bibelsmann, 
who is a student of International Affairs Program at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, and Varun Bhagat, who is a final year master's student at the Geneva Graduate Institute specializing in sustainable trade. We will now hear from Mr. Tambani Malapella. He will set the global scene in relation to the digitalization in agriculture sector. As indicated earlier, please post any questions in the Q&A module. Your questions will be answered by the speakers during the session or at the end of our meeting time for a meeting. Please, Mr. Malapella, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for welcoming me here. Um, I'm going to offer uh, some remarks here. I'm honored really to be invited to this edition of uh, FAO in Geneva Agricultural Trade, Trade Talks and specifically to offer some remarks on the global scene in relation to digitization in agriculture. For me, this meeting comes very close to the FAO Geneva Trade Platform Hackathon, Imagining Apps for Sustainable Agriculture, which was held on the 17th of November, 2022, and which I was honored to be a jury to see some of the solutions that were presented at that meeting. What really touched me there was how the youth can contribute to transforming agriculture to become more sustainable and resilient through digital transformation to present their applications that were designed to support sustainable use of um, resources such as fertilizer and other inputs by the farmers. So we are meeting here and we we are gaining on this um, uh, progress in these uh, trade talks. And it allows us to deliberate on how digital technologies are indispensable to feed a continuously growing population and also sustainable use of resources, including uh, the challenges that we have. I'm particularly pleased that the focus is really still on the youth and on innovative solutions as a central part of the agricultural transformation and productivity and digitalization in agriculture. Just laying back uh, on the much more broader uh, objectives, such issues are very, very important for FAO, digitization, innovation, digital agriculture, science, technology, and innovation, focusing on youth and women are very important to us. You might ha also have heard that FAO just recently had, FAO just recently had a science and innovation strategy which aims to strengthen the FAO's work on science, technology, and innovation, and to accelerate the transformation of agri-food systems so that they become more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems for a better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. So ladies and gentlemen, we are having this meeting uh, when we do have global challenges and of opportunities of transforming agri-food systems for such issues. We're just about to come out of the COVID-19 situation. We are having geopolitical instability and conflict. We have climate-induced crises. We have biodiversity loss, the rising cost of food, the weakening and increasing hunger, and increasing inequalities. The effects really do not look good. For example, between 702 and 828 million people were affected by hunger in 2021. We're still looking to see what 2022 would look like. The number has grown about 150 million since the outbreak of COVID-19, 103 million people between 2019 and 2020, which, had, which was an addition of 46 million more in 2021. Recently, we just uh, in a couple of uh, days, we heard of the earthquake in, in countries. We are having serious challenges as, in, in a global level. So furthermore, food systems are really also facing threat from climate change and uh, as we have noted, other sustainable use of inputs. So in order to overcome these challenges, FAO believes that science, technology and innovation should be placed at the center of agri-food system transformation. And most importantly, digitalization, if implemented sustainable, is a key driver in the transformation of agri-food systems. Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at making the transformation of agri-food systems a reality and achieve the sustainable development of goals, we need to invest in digital technologies and also digitalization as a way to accelerate some of these gains that we have and also to overcome the challenges that I mentioned above. If implemented properly, digitalization has the potential to increase agricultural productivity 
and food security while enhancing the sustainability and inclusiveness of the global agri-food sector, triggering new partnership and opportunities for emerging actors. By empowering smallholder farmers with uh, innovative technologies that enhance food sustainability and building resilient, we should be able to fight against food losses. So really, digital technologies can apply and play a key role in improving security. Precision agriculture, for example, uh, the use of sensor networks and data analytics to help farmers optimize crop yields and improve water and fertilizer management and other inputs management can lead to a more efficient use of resources and greater crop yields, which can help to ensure that more people have access to nutritious food. But for these technologies, we need to be inclusive to ensure that when we apply digitalization, we are not leaving anyone behind. Another example is using big data and artificial intelligence technologies to inform decision-making on processes on food supply chain from farm to table is another important aspect of digital transformation in food security. This can help identify potential bottlenecks and inefficiencies in the systems, allowing for more effective food distributions. So the rise of emerging technologies such as metaverse, artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotics, also offer more opportunities in agriculture. And I hope some of my colleagues here, as we are going to venture into the debate, they might explore much detail in some of these areas. I would like to take this on moment to share a few examples of what FAO has been doing in the area of digitalization. FAO considers digitalization as a, as a key uh, approach to work. For example, uh, digital agriculture is part of the 20 program priority areas of um, uh, the FAO's work. And also FAO really uh, moves onto the digital for impact as a means of delivering. We have, for example, the FAO's hand-in-hand -hand initiative, which uses geospatial, biophysical, and social economic data, as well as advanced analytics to identify territories where agriculture transformation and sustainable management of forestries and fisheries have the greatest potential for alleviating poverty in data. So the hand-in-hand the hand -in -hand, hand -in -hand geospatial platform is a crucial tool for all efforts to build better, better and create more resilient food systems post-COVID. An increasing of number of countries that are participating in this platform shows a successful use and application of data and geospatial technologies in tackling the challenges that we face. Associated Spouse Open Access Geospatial Platform, which is a digital public good, provides advanced information federating food security indicators and agricultural statistics, combining geographic information and statistical data on more than 10 domains, including food security, crops, soil, water, climate, fisheries, livestock, and forestry. So this platform unlocks millions of data layers from different domains and sources to serve as a key enabling tool for digital agriculture experts, economists, government agencies, and other stakeholders working in the food and agricultural sector. Related to this is the Digital Villages Initiatives, which aims to convert our digital villages across the world into digital hubs to support the acceleration of rural transformation and reduce the digital gap, including the gender and rural divide. So this initiative is being rolled out globally in close partnership with FAO's regional offices and our members across the globe. As you can see from my small enumeration of these um, initiatives, you can see that FAO is uh, trying to uh, embed digitalization into its work by ensuring that we are not leaving everyone behind. The theme of our discussion today talks about the opportunities and challenges. The digitalization is coming when already the societies have challenges that are existing. If not implemented um, with conscious care, digitalization can exacerbate the already existing divides or inequalities, such as gender divide, rural divide, rich and poor divide. We should ensure that when we implement digital technologies, we should be cognizant of the challenges and the gaps that exist. These are just a few examples of digital agriculture and innovation interventions focusing on FAO's or FAO's Digital for Impact portfolio. So FAO remains 
committed, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, to strengthen global collaboration on the future of food and farming and enhancing digital transformations in the food agriculture sector with all the parties. We are really excited to be part of this uh, discussion in FAO Geneva to bring all stakeholders into this discussion. FAO notices and understands that working in this area, we need to work with like-minded uh, in uh, organizations and partners in addressing the needs of our members. I will share with you an interesting picture that um, really I like it very much. Uh, it offers uh, a bit of an, uh, I don't know whether you can see the picture. Okay, so when you see this cartoon picture, um, it shows that the future of agriculture is changing. From this picture, you see where we come from and where we are going. Uh, this is just an example of one area, which is mechanization. We see at the end of the picture um, that the future of agriculture is likely to be very digital, very mechanical. So FAO has a vital role to play the, digi the, the digital ecosystem for sustainable agri-food system. So the notion of sustainability needs to be translated in digital terms. And we are all just at the beginning of this journey. We need to ensure that when we get to this area, um, we are not uh, leaving um, anyone behind. Let me see if I can unshare this picture. So the constructive dialogues like this, joint actions like this, uh, hackathons, uh, bringing youth together, exchanges of best practices in the use of digital uh, technologies must be key components of shaping the most targeted policies for the future of our agri-food system, where we all likely to have a role to play. As you have seen in the, my cartoon that I just showed, humans certainly are disappearing. We do not want to have a situation like that. So we are also participating as FAO with the global uh, initiatives within the UN system on ensuring how we keep young people, how we keep uh, youth and humans as part of the agri-food systems. So the future of the technology and food systems lies in the next technologies, lies also in the next generation. The awareness and acknowledgement of the problem has increased the chances of making a change for a better and, and better future and likelihood of an effort that can be made to reverse the harmful consequences of technologies that might have to family farmers and smallholders is put in place today. So I hope that our discussions today addresses the investments, both from an opportunistic perspective and also from a challenges perspective. I especially look forward for exchanges today and what comes next. Thank you. Uh, we would like to thank you very much, Mr. Malapela, for this comprehensive overview of the topic, your pertinent, pertinent points concerning digitalization and agriculture, including what FAO is doing in this area, including FAO's major initiatives um, relevant and associated with digital, digital life. Now we will hear from the winners. Uh, Varun and Maximilian will present the application they designed and named the Green Crop app, which aims to support fertilizer used by farmers and to support domestic pulse making. Please, Varun and Maximilian, the floor is yours. Hi, is the slide visible? Yes, we can, we can see it, perfect. Perfect. So greetings to everyone who's joining from Geneva and around the world. Uh, as highlighted, Maximilian and I will be presenting the app ideation that made us win the FAO GDP student hackathon held in November last year. And we named it Green Crop primarily because uh, it dealt with the sustainability challenges associated with uh, fertilizers. This is what we aim to cover in a very brief presentation today, beginning with the very rational of why we thought of developing an app in this field moving forward to the key phases of the application, how it functions, the input requirement in terms of data, et cetera. The potential scaling up of the app and the foreseen limitations will be covered in the way ahead section. So coming to why the app is needed and why we thought it was necessary to sort of pitch an idea of having an app in this domain. 
uh, as we all know, there has been a shortage of fertilizers in the global market since about an, an year now. And both FAO and WTO have estimated that this fertilizer shortage will persist into 2023. And such a condition makes it very tough for regions like Africa to secure the requisite uh, fertilizer supply and then maintain the food production. Secondly, this global shortage of fertilizers comes at a time when there has been an increasing dependence on fertilizers by farmers for growing their crops. And as we all know, this over, over usage and over dependence on fertilizers has and can further lead to reduced production per unit of fertilizer. This means that more and more fertilizers would be required to ensure this to match and ensure the same yield as before. This would result in increased costs for farmers and lower profits. In terms of environmental degradation, it's a well-known fact that fertilizers can and have uh, a detrimental impact on environment. So with all those factors and uh, conditions in mind, we knew that we had to develop an app which could in some way target these issues and provide a much more sustainable take on the issue of fertilizers and the concerning areas. So the key points of the app include our target users are the critical stakeholders of the agriculture sector, both farmers and policymakers. Our objective, as I just mentioned, is to address the critical issues and promote sustainable practices. We will uh, present it in subsequent slides that these sustainable practices are not just for fertilizers per se, but for the larger agriculture sectors. And we'll just show how. Uh, and we aim to achieve this by including a scientific measure for providing us uh, an optimal fertilizer usage for farmers and then a dialogue platform for knowledge sharing and best practices among the policy makers. We identified Brazil as a pilot project country because we noticed that it has a high import dependence on fertilizers and then given the sort of contemporary uh, scenario for the geo for the global market of fertilizers. The kind the government had last year implemented a na national fertilizer plan to sort of reduce its dependence on import as well as usage of the fertilizers domestically. So such conditions made uh, Brazil as a perfect place in our opinion to roll out our app. So we identified and took uh, Brazil forward while designing the app. So once uh, this application has been downloaded, this is the first page that any user or person uh, will see. Uh, there will be two language options, English and Portuguese. This has been kept in mind uh, with Brazil as a pilot project country. And then the user can select their profile either as a farmer or a policy maker, and then their region from a drop down list and then submit their data. In case a user has selected a policy maker profile in the uh, registration page, this is the home page they will be directed to. The, under the first option of database policy framework, they will have access to all the relevant policy frameworks that have been enacted at both the national as well as international framework. So just to highlight, this would include all the policy frameworks such as uh, the framework which FAO enacted in 2019 with multilateral support for the usage of fertilizers. So all the policy frameworks that have been enacted relating to fertilizers will be there. So have an, they have an easy access to the data and they do not need to look anywhere else. Secondly, uh, there will also be a dialogue platform for the policy uh, for the policy makers to interact and engage with their colleagues at the regional, at the national as well as their international counterparts and the representatives from FAO on the matters of fertilizers and agriculture at large. Lastly, the policymakers will also benefit from a series of informative videos on refining their skill sets. More on the videos on this slide. So under the informative videos, they will have a multiple of options as you can see on this slide. Under the recent facts and findings, the policymakers will be able to sort of be up to date with the latest developments in this particular field of uh, fertilizers and the larger sustainable agriculture. Uh, in the option of success stories of policymakers, our idea was that 
uh, with the short clips of policy makers that were successful in implementing sustainable practices pertaining to both uh, fertilizers in the larger agriculture domain. Other policy makers would be encouraged and motivated to do the same in their region. Lastly, under the strategic communication option, policy makers will uh, see uh, videos as to how they can improve their interpersonal skills and also they will uh, be given certain strategies as to how they could interact with the farmers at the local level so as to motivate them and encourage and ensure a rather, rather a wider adoption of sustainable practices. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Vern. So now we will see the interface of the farmers, starting with their homepage, um, where you can see the key sub product of them, which is the fertilizer calculator, which would uh, indicate the optimal quantity of fertilizers to be used uh, while growing the crop. This uh, calculator would derive this value after taking into account various parameters that we will talk after this slide. Furthermore, farmers will benefit from the convenient access to the small videos of uh, easy to adopt sustainable practices. Additionally, having testimonials of farmers that, uh, that have adopted such similar sustainable measures, either based on the videos or through their own innovative spirit, will be presented and celebrated as success stories. And uh, the third option is that any questions, ask an expert option. Uh, provided in the app to the farmers will give them the option to reach their local offices or the regional FAO offices in case of a question or a problem. Then the next slide, please. The fertilizer calculator is now looked into more detail. First of all, um, before putting in the relevant nutrition values of the soil in the case that they are known, the type of crop, the growing season, the area of the field and which fertilizers prefer to be used are asked for uh, to create an accurate amount for fertilizer usage. And when you fill that out, you will come to the next uh, slide which is the soil report so in the case that the farmers have the relevant data available uh, they will have to put in the ph value nitrogen value phosphorus potassium sulfur as well as zinc values which are just an example of which can be relevant but it is depending on the type of crop and other factors also so this is just an idea but it is not necessarily the perfect fertilizer calculator for every crop and then once they fill that out, they get the report available that they can either download or just view. And also additionally, they have the chance to get more information on sustainable farming, which will bring them to the video section that I'll talk about afterwards. So the video section um, is where the farmers get the chance to watch the easy to adopt sustainable practices as well as the best practice example videos. And even today, the FAO already published videos around that topic on, on their official YouTube channel, which are the ones that are being used as examples on this slide. So now we will talk about the input requirements that will be necessary for the app. The first uh, input requirement is for uh, for farmers um, to uh, refine the existing fertilizer calculation mechanism, because as we said, it depends on which crop uh, is being used and there would have to be an expert looking into the uh, detailed calculator. We just gave an example of how one could look based on the available information on the internet, but just to make it more accurate. And also the second option, uh, is the requirement of soil report for accurate results, which means that not every farmer has those soil reports available and they make uh, the result a lot more accurate, which is why they are very important for the app. 
And also there's the need to create the videos on the one hand, the ones for the policymakers as well as for the farmers. And that is also uh, a task that has uh, to be done before the app can be used. And we also think that in general, the success of the app will be dependent greatly on the active participation of local and national policymakers to support the promotion of sustainable practices within the pharma community, which is the overall goal of the app. And then the next slide, please. Yeah, so the way ahead is on one hand, the future prospects um, where we see the app in later stages could have a, a messaging feature for the policymakers to interact on a one-to-one -one basis, both nationally and internationally. And furthermore, the subsequent versions of the app are envisioned to see feedback from the farmers at the end of the yield, uh, indicating the usage of the fertilizers and the overall output so that you can compare how much fertilizers they used in which year and what the results were based on that. This can be later then used also to uh, show other farmers how effective this can be. Then uh, coming to the limitations of the app, the one problem could be that there are a lot of variables that cannot be estimated. Uh, for example, a drastic change in weather or also pest attacks. So uh, this can also affect the yield. And additionally, the tailoring of the sustainable policy frameworks could be another limitation because that's also dependent on local uh, governments and is uh, hard to calculate before on how effective this will be done. And yes, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, you can fill them out and we'll talk about it later. Um, thank you very much, Varun and Maximilian, for, for this very excellent presentation. Um, following your presentation, now Mr. Mosava will present a real-life example of the process on how their company brings and brought an application into life. As I indicated during my introductory remarks, Mr. Safaf is the head of sales and data success at Ekplov. Ekplov is a market data and intelligence startup company based in Geneva, Switzerland, with the mission of digitalizing agricultural markets. Please, Mr. Safaf, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, thank you uh, very much for, for having me. I um, want to uh, echo some of the sentiments of the, the other speakers in uh, being honored to, uh, to have been invited uh, to speak here and to give you a perspective um, a different perspective, I guess, from the private sector. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So, um, yes, uh, as, as uh, Pinar mentioned, so um, Agflow, uh, our core mission, I suppose, is incredibly relevant um, to the basis of this webinar. It is to digitalize agricultural markets. Um, my role within that, so we have been in business since uh, 2013, um, and um, from 2019, um, there was a, a new management wave, uh, a restructuring of the company, a renewed vigor and a renewed vision, um, and I was part of that, that movement. Um, so I have been working uh, really uh, as head of sales and data success, which means I direct the commercial strategies that are relevant to um, new client acquisition, um, the relationship management of uh, both clients and data partners. Um, so I've been really seeing the evolution over the past three years in terms of our, our product development, which is um, very much um, uh, reliant on the, the data partner network that we have, um, because essentially what we do is collect um, uh, market data from a proprietary network of 140 to 150 companies um across the full value chain of the the agricultural industry um so just to um give you an idea so so why are we here um so we have two key challenges that we see that are, i think are, are very unique to the uh, agricultural industry actually um these are uh, an asymmetric value distribution um and unprecedented market volatility so um 
agricultural practice um, is, is quite old school. Um, a lot of um, uh, knowledge and, and information sharing uh, can be um, informal, uh, quite casual, uh, really dependent on who you know. Um, and so if you're trying to create um, uh, an informed decision, um, the, the lower you are in the value chain or the less people you know, um, the more challenging that becomes. So uh, for a local farmer or a smaller producer, producer or an exporter, um, they may not have the access that some of the larger companies do. Um, and that makes it quite, quite challenging. Um, and so in this sense, we see uh, an asymmetric distribution, as I say, and a fundamental breakage in, in, um, uh, in the data sharing and data democratization in, in the industry. When you add to that, the fact that um, markets are incredibly volatile, um, you know, a, a lot, and the FAO will obviously know much more than me, but um, there are a lot of geopolitical challenges um, that, that really are um, uh, directly impacting food supply and food security. Um, and a very tangible example is that it's, it are obviously the events of, of last year and still unfolding in, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, and so the need to have uh, reliable uh, data um, in order to mitigate the, the food supply risks it has never been more important. So um, just to give you a bit of a, a graphic and a visual to, to try and uh, describe that a bit more um, uh, holistically. Um, so we're really trying to streamline um, the, the collection, um, the cleaning and the presentation of data um, in order for uh, different players across the market chain to make informed decisions. Um, and, and most importantly, um, uh, to do that digitally, of course, um, and to um, keep the supply chain resilient. So um, again, coming back to that idea of, of some of the smaller players, um, you know, they really, they really can uh, be in a position where they are, you know, becoming price takers, not actually um, creating or generating their own uh, business uh, due to the the the, the uh, uh, issue with distribution, um, and that makes the the whole process of the supply chain quite unresilient. Um, and so, um, giving them a fair uh, and democratic right to um, uh, a wide range of data sets is is really at the heart of our long term uh, vision at Agflow. Um, so on this slide, you can kind of see the, the wide range of, of data sets that we cover. Um, for your interest, the uh, darker squares are, are the proprietary privileged information that we collect from this network. Um, the, the core business has, has always been focused on uh, a number of data sets, which are uh, the physical cash price of goods, um, mainly grains, oil seeds, veg oils, uh, some pulses and stocks. Um, the cost to ship those goods, um, which we acquire from um, shipping companies and freight forwarders, and um, the s and uh, lineup information, so which vessels are carrying which agricultural go goods in and out of ports around the world. And um, what from that strong foundation and from the, the, the strategic relationships and partnerships we have created, um, we are then able to direct our commercial strategy and our product development based on the market trends. So um, where we've started to build additional use cases for people like risk managers, um, we are able to direct efforts into things like algorithmic forward curves. So, so using a bank of factual data, we are then um, able to, to speak to our clients, analyze a total addressable market, um, really get feedback and, and involvement with these uh, uh, clients or users um, to see if the market requires uh, potential data sets or tools to support them. Um, and another good example of that is a, a CFR matrix, CFR calculator that we created with one of our strategic partners. Um, really, we, we highlighted that as a pain point for something that they were doing, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so um, utilizing and, and crossing our, our cash price data set with our freight, we were able to generate a tool for them, which then became commercially viable to other use cases across the industry and the supply chain. And so one of the, the big pieces of advice I'd give in terms of the commercialization is the importance of developing a use case um, and also um, really getting market feedback as to the um, uh, real need to that. So, 
So when I say the, the use case, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, how can you make their life easier on, on a day to day basis? Right. Um, and those are the kind of tools that we've been able to create with the strong data bank that we have. Um, we also have a number of other data sets uh, that are, are a lot more relevant when it comes to things like supply and demand, food supply and, and that kind of thing. And uh, just for your interest, the, the long term goal for us uh, really is to, to cross these data sets. So um, uh, have a, an idea as to you know why the cash price uh, is where it is. Um, dependent on the movement of goods, depending on the weather, um, depending on national stocks. Um, so, so really, um, that's what we're trying to get to because the market has informed us that that's what they would want to see. Um, so, uh, just to give you a very tangible use case of um, an ongoing project at the moment, um, we were very honoured to um, uh, successfully win a grant with uh, InnoSwiss um uh in in the past uh, 18 months and um the idea is to develop um in unison with uh, HES and um uh, University of Luzerne um a an app for farmers um and the idea again is uh, coming back to the the challenge that we've seen with um uh, data not being readily available to people at a more local level is again um uh, uh, as you can see, um, we, we, we've highlighted with them a, a big challenge um, for them to get uh, access to reliable information. Uh, the goal of the tool is to use natural language processing to scrape open sources and privileged sources um, and develop a tool uh, that is customized to an individual um, at a farmer local level. Um, so, for instance, if you're working um, in West Africa, um you're unaware of what's going on in the market we can scrape um, a lot of local information um, and then actionably uh, demonstrate that on an app um, that would be readily available so you can make an informed decision um, so that that in a nutshell is, is the kind of goal so um, using that kind of machine learning uh, artificial intelligence um, is um, uh, a much smoother and automated process um, so we're currently developing that, and like I say, the result will be to have this uh, user-friendly mobile application um, from vetted sources um, that are customized to the individual user. So um, I just wanted to give a, a bit of a shout out to the team and also a, a bit of encouragement to those that are obviously working in commercializing uh, tech within AG because we're, we're a very small team, uh, we're very dynamic, uh, we're, we're diverse and global. Um, and uh, I think uh, just in the lens of, of commercialization, you know, um, with the right expertise and the right communication and the right passion, um, there isn't really a limit to, to what can be achieved. Um, so, um, yeah, just wanted to give you the, the idea that even within those three or four years, we've been able to scale up and grow um, not just our, our own internal team, but our data partners and, and obviously the, the projects that we work on. And finally, just to give you kind of an idea in, in a nutshell, um, some of the, the, the companies uh, that we work with and that really validate the, the work that we're doing. Um, and obviously a bit more context as to um, why we do what we do and, and what our goal is in the long term. Um, so thank you for listening and yeah, we're happy to take any questions. Um. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Safa, for your points from a private sector perspective. It's really interesting to, to, to hear what ECLOV is doing in the area of digitalization, including the recent project you have been working on. Um, today, we also have a digital agriculture and strategy expert from FAO's regional office for Africa, uh, Mr. Ken Lohanto. Uh, Mr. Lohanto will provide the regional perspective from Africa on how digital technology can play an important role in the region in terms of sustainable agriculture agenda. Please, Mr. Lohanto, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, once again, let me share my screen. I think it is this one. Yes, thanks for, very much for um, the opportunity indeed. Um, and uh, greeting to everyone. Um, so I work for uh, the regional office for Africa, so uh, headquartered in uh, Ghana. 
So I would like to uh, share with you some insights on um, how the digital agriculture landscape is um, evolving in Africa, particularly uh, relating to uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, I will be more focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. That, that is the focus of the Regional Office for Africa because we have another office that covers North Africa. Uh, so most of the example that I will be giving will be related to uh, that uh, specific geography. Uh, so first, um, as you may see on the screen, uh, we have about um, 400 um, active applications, um, platforms, and on digital agriculture, according to various estimates. Um, and these applications are actually uh, coming across all the different use cases of digital agriculture. So we have most of the services or platforms that are uh, serving advisory services. Uh, market linkages is uh, the second use case where we have more usage of digital agriculture. We also have uh, a variety of uh, uh, platforms that are addressing access to finance. Um, supply chain management is another area where we are having more and more uh, applications. Um, and then we also have one um, specific use case that we call macro uh, agrointelligence basically uh, meaning the use of a variety of data platforms, for example, by government, but some, sometimes also by um, um, private sector so that uh, they can really draw intelligence from the data that have been shared. So I think um, uh, the colleague that just presented uh, highlighted some of the usages, particularly some that may be related to um, macro agrointelligence. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly the region where we have most usage of digitalization in agriculture is uh, obviously, as uh, you may suspect, East Africa. Uh, and uh, a region where we have the least is uh, Central Africa, where we have just about 6% of uh, the active um, digital agriculture uh, platform. So if we want to improve uh, things in that area, these are some of the area where that, that we need to, uh, like I would say, uh, be active. Uh, some of the data that have been sharing are more or less uh, data of 2020. So maybe currently we have more um, uh, advances, but uh, basically the picture is that one. Now, um, I want to, let's say, zero in a bit or, or be more specific when we talk about uh, sustainable agriculture. So we have seen different use cases in the previous slide. Uh, and uh, when we really want to more uh, talk about sustainable agriculture, if we follow uh, the, the model, the framework of FAO, uh, which has identified uh, five key principles of um, sustainable agriculture, we can classify existing platform in those five categories. So we have platform, we do have platform that are supporting the improvement of uh, the use of natural resources for more efficiency, uh, which is one of uh, one, one of the key area of sustainable agriculture. And uh, I have put there some example, like for example, in Tunisia, we have the robot care, which is a platform that is supporting pest management uh, using also artificial intelligence and, and others. Uh, we have also at another layer, for example, considering the need to uh, protect and enhance natural resources. We have a number of platforms that exist. Uh, even at FAO, we have, for example, what we call the e-locust platform that support addressing and eradicating diesel locusts. Uh, in crop production. So this is something that is uh, we are we, we have been uh, using in different uh, geographies, particularly in East Africa. We also have uh, um, an organization called IGAD, which is uh, which has a number of systems supporting uh, climate change. Uh, let's say uh, addressing climate change issues. So these are some of the um, the the, the platforms we have that are supporting sustainable agriculture. So by and large, as you can see on the screen in every area or in all the key area that are related to sustainable agriculture, we, we do have platform that in currently in Africa that we are using. Some, some of them are not from Africa per se, but they are operational in Africa. But we have some challenges, particularly when we talk about um, um, the, uh, using digital tools for, uh, uh, let's say, improving 
sustainable agriculture or for achieving sustainable agriculture. And I would like particularly to take the example of uh, the technologies that are supporting uh, climate smart agriculture. So what we call digital climate smart agriculture services and highlight some of the key challenges that we have in that area in Africa, uh, particularly, but I think it is uh, more than in Africa. We ha also have some of those challenges uh, elsewhere. One of the key challenge that we have is that because uh, many of the platforms that are supporting climate smart agriculture are quite new, actually, so we don't have enough knowledge on uh, and best practices as well as uh, lessons learned in that area. So how do we use digitalization to address climate smart agriculture? We don't have enough lessons learned in that area. So this is something that we may want to work on. Um, we have a lot of pilots here and there, but we don't have large scale uh, implementation because of a variety of reasons that may include access to finance challenges for government, for example. We have some projects that are not going to scale sometimes even us, I mean, uh, donors, we fund projects just for two years, one year, and then it does not always favor uh, implementing at large scale. We have also issues relating to um, uh, R&D and technical capacity, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in poorer countries to develop uh, digital uh, climate smart agriculture solutions. For example, when we are talking about uh, satellite services, geospatial services, many um, uh, uh, developers or many stakeholders uh, in Africa that don't have enough scale really to uh, develop effective services. Sometimes uh, when you do hackathons in Africa, uh, they may provide prototypes but these prototype, if they really uh, they want to go to scale, they face challenges because they have limited capacity. So at the level of universities, for example, there are a lot of um, support that we can, we, we can bring so that in, at the university level, at the incubators level, we have the capacity really to better develop those kind of services. And we have also an issue relating to the sustainability of business models, particularly when we are talking about startups. This is a critical issue that is, uh, uh, let's say, impacting the effectiveness of the solutions that we are developing during hackathons or the solutions that uh, our uh, young uh, entrepreneurs are putting uh, on the market. And of course, we have a lack of funding for uh, all that uh, is related to uh, climate smart agriculture. I think uh, we have all heard report, particularly from the, the uh, IPCC or uh, the GCA, the global, uh, um, I forgot the, the, the full definition. And they have highlighted that currently we have a lack of 7 billion USD that, that are needed really to bring uh, additional 300 million smallholder farmers globally by 2030. Uh, into, uh, I would say, the effectiveness of the usage of, uh, the, of, of climate smart agriculture. So we have a lot of funding needs. And this is why, for example, at the last COP, uh, I think uh, that was organized, there have been a lot of calls for more funding for climate smart agriculture in general. So these are some of the challenges that we are facing. And FAO has been also very working with a variety of companies. Uh, for example, we have a program at the regional level, at the regional Office for Africa that we call Digital Village Initiative. And in that framework in Senegal, for example, we are working with a company called Tolbi uh, when we were doing the pilot and they have provided some climate smart agriculture services. We also, okay, maybe I'll now just give um, other quick, uh, I would say recommendation to close. Uh, by and large, there are some, I would say, five key areas where we need to bring more support if we want to support uh, digitalization for climate smart agriculture and digitalization for agriculture as a whole. Uh, first of all, I think we need to work around innovation to support better innovation, particularly for young entrepreneurs so that uh, we can strengthen their offering and strengthen the opportunity that they may have uh, supporting uh, data-driven digital climate smart agriculture and R&D. Uh, working more uh, to promote partnership, multi-stakeholder partnership, even at, uh, let's say, African level between the government, the, st the startups, the research entities, the farmer organization, or the organization supporting agri-food system, include more women. And this is the key issue 
particularly when it comes to digital agriculture entrepreneurship. We don't have in, enough women that are at the, at the head of those companies. So this is something that uh, is a, an issue. Even at the level of uh, rural areas, women don't have enough capacity to leverage utilization for the small businesses. So these are areas that we need to address. And of course, working on capacity building, promoting enabling environment for digital agriculture, et cetera. So um, I, would, I would like to start by saying that um, we have a lot of opportunities to really impact uh, smallholder farmers, agriculture and growth in uh, Africa through digitalization. Um, currently, it has been estimated that we only have 6% of the market of digital agriculture that has been uh, captured for now. So we see that then we have a large gap, particularly for businesses, there is a huge opportunity. Uh, also, for now, about only 20% of smallholder farmers are reached by digital services. It does not mean that they are really impacted, but at least they are reached because when you want to talk about impact, it is another business. You need to really have more specific data. Uh, and we really need to improve the, um, the, the business models. For example, better promote bundling of services. I think that entrepreneurs are better understanding that in Africa now, particularly young entrepreneurs, but we need to continue, I mean, leveraging those, uh, I would say, successful business models. And lastly, we really need to support entrepreneurs, especially the young entrepreneurs, so that we strengthen the local ecosystem, so that we strengthen the local offering as well, so that they can be more competitive and uh, um, I mean, offer services that can also be globally effective. So thank you, I'll stop here for now. And if we have questions, I can uh, respond to them. Thank you very much. Um, we would like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lohanto, for those pertinent points in relation to the digitalization and agriculture with a focus on the Sub-Saharan Africa and how FA was supporting in the region. Now, our last speaker is uh, Mr. Caesar Woolley. His remarks will focus on the youth and technology and their role in the sustainable agriculture agenda. Uh, please, Mr. Woolley, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Pinar, and to um, you know all the speakers that have gone before me for all those insightful points. Um, as as rightly said, so I work um, with the FAO's regional office for Africa, also based here in Ghana, and um, function as a regional youth employment specialist within our decent employment in agri food systems team. And um, this afternoon, I'm happy to contribute around the subject of youth and technology and their role in the sustainable agriculture agenda. This has been touched on a little bit by um, some of you know, the speakers before me, but I wanted to just take a step back um, and really you know, also talk about some of the key drivers of the sustainable agriculture agenda, um, which Mr. Lohento sort of defined you know, in his remarks just before me. So a few things. One, we know that globally, you know, there's a growing population that's expected to reach nearly 10 billion by the middle of the century. Um, along with this growing population will be rising food consumption needs, which we must find ways to sort of address in order to safeguard the health and the productivity of the growing population. Uh, these first two points sort of relate to sort of the future, but if you even take the present and the immediate past, um, like Mr. Malapella, uh, mentioned, you know, we have a situation of worsening global hunger. And over the last two years, you know, about 46 million people, additional people have been affected by hunger and bringing the total number around the world to um, over 800 million. We also have a situation where, you know, we're experiencing an aging farming population around the world, but even specifically in sub-Saharan Africa, where the global, where the average age of a farmer is somewhere between 50 and 60 years old which um, tells you that there's a need to sort of replenish the labor force within the sector. And so when you take all these um, factors and, and, and combine them, they, they collectively point to the growing need for sustainable agri-food systems. And what that really means, what I wanna focus on is the need to address the hunger and nutrition challenges of today without negatively impacting our ability to solve those same problems tomorrow as far as the environment and food security are concerned. So, uh, I'm supposed to change, yeah. So, focusing on youth, you know, why are youth well-positioned to contribute to this 
agenda around sustainable agriculture, a few facts. Um, one is that youth account for nearly 20% of the global population. And when you focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, you see that youth actually con con constitutes over 60% of the population. And what this represents is a strong labor force potential, what we call a demographic dividend that can be leveraged to address the agri-food systems um, challenges, both of today, um, while also building resilient food systems for tomorrow. The other reason youth are important is because they are already well positioned to drive the transition to more sustainable practices in agriculture, um, because food systems are the largest employer for young people as we speak today, and specifically in Africa. But the issue with that is, you know, most of those jobs that youth have in agri-food systems uh, are not yet green or not green enough and um, are informal, probably don't pay a living wage and so are not decent. When we say jobs are decent, we're talking about the extent to which they are safe and able to pay living wages. So there's a need to create more green and decent jobs within agri-food systems um, and youth are well positioned to take these jobs. And then finally, but not the least, um, it's obvious that youth have longer working lives ahead of them than older adults. And so any investment that is targeting the future of food systems um, would smartly be placed if, if, if it is made in youth, right? Um, so those are some reasons why youth are well positioned to contribute to the sustainable agriculture agenda. Now the question is, um, you know, we're talking about youth and technology. So how can, you, how can technology essentially boost youth contribution to the sustainable agriculture agenda. I want to talk about a few opportunities um, that, you know, um, yeah, that are relevant here. And I think of this in terms of the three Ds, right? So technology is able to de-risk, digitalize, and diversify youth participation in agriculture. When we talk about de-risking, we know that youth, um, young women and men have had you know, um, maybe the, the, the smallest opportunity to live and work and accrue capital to invest in agriculture. And so the little money or funds that young people are able to invest in agriculture and agribusiness need to be protected. The risks around agriculture need to be minimized in order to safeguard those investments and guarantee a return. And so what digital technologies are able to do is essentially um, reduce those risks. So you have things like the provision of weather information, you have e-extension services, you have remote sensing and monitoring technologies. Um, all of these sort of allow youth to access data and information to make better decisions on the farm and ultimately reduce crop failure if you're talking about production. I'm sure we can have this conversation and you know around different uh, nodes of value chains, but for the purposes of illustration, I focus on production here, right? And so these technologies, this information, again, reduce the risk of crop failure because youth will then have information and data for decision-making around when to prepare, how to prepare the land, when to plant, when to water, how to apply inputs. We talked about precision agriculture earlier on, when to harvest and things like that. The other risk that is reduced by technology are those environmental risks, especially when you focus on precision agriculture. Um, you know, when you look at Farm, farmland analysis, it's easy to apply fertilizer. You know, our, our, our um, hackathon winners are focused on fertilizer. The traditional practice is just to apply fertilizer across the entire farmland at specific periods of time. But there might be specific sort of points or areas on the farm that need more or less fertilizer than others. And so having information and, 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 and data through the remote sensing and, and, and monitoring technologies allows for these very precise application of inputs, um, which then ultimately reduces agriculture's impact on the environment. The second D here has to do with the digitalization of farm business operations, um, while also increasing access to market and profitability for um, young agripreneurs. And the point here really is, is, is how the incorporation of digital technologies can essentially reduce labor, physical labor requirements on farms and free up um, time through this optimization process for youth to invest in, 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 in scaling up their ideas or invest in other aspects of, of value chains. So we have a lot of mobile and web-based services like Mr. Lohento started to 
to share. That improve access to finance, they improve access to markets, um, they improve access to digital technologies. And these, these digital te technologies or these solutions um, by further digitalizing, you know, agricultural production and management practices um, contribute to the overall sustainability of the agricultural sector. The other sort of thing I want to talk about around digitalization is, is that access to market. So, you know, one of the things that young people in agriculture struggle with, right, is, is price transparency, is, is transparency around what are the best markets um, for the sale of their produce. You have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that is now in force. How do youth understand or come to understand which markets in Africa are best positioned to absorb their products um, and their services? It's through digital technologies and digital tools, right? So digitalization really does create huge opportunities in terms of access to markets um, and profitability for youth. And then finally, technology enables the diversification of youth participation in agricultural value chains. Uh, one of the challenge we, one of the challenges we, we, we tend to see is that there's a heavy concentration um, of young people at the production end, so the upstream end of agricultural value chains. But I think everybody on this on this call understands that value chains are very diverse and opportunities exist. Many opportunities exist um, all along the value chain, whether you're talking about crop or animal value chains. And so digital technologies sort of um, allow young people to be able to identify or plug into those different aspects. Um, so again, you can sort of tap into mechanization, you can tap into aggregation, you can tap into the provision of financial services, you can tap into the provision of weather related information, you can tap into um, transportation and logistics management. You know, these are all things that are data driven and technology driven. And so they, you know, again, they provide new opportunities um, for youth to plug into the more downstream aspects of agricultural value chains. And ultimately, a more diversified value chain is a stronger value chain, right? Because it's more complete and it's more competitive. So taking together, technology has a strong potential to make agriculture more attractive to and profitable for young people, um, has strong potential to ensure sustainable management of land, water, and natural resources, um, and then boost youth involvement in agribusiness and the sustainable agriculture agenda. To conclude, um, just want to talk about how or some of the best practices for fostering youth um, increased youth participation in the sustainable agriculture space. And what we do, you know, I, I, I am the regional coordinator for what we call the Opportunities for Youth in Africa program. And we take an integrated approach, right, to, to fostering youth participation in agriculture and agribusiness. And that integrated approach comprises capacity building on one level, access to land, markets, and services. And this includes financial and technology services. And then also creating an enabling environment by working with policymakers and governments to essentially invest in, 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 in making um, things more conducive for youth to participate in agriculture. So at the capacity building level, we have you know, investments in training um, for existing and aspiring youth agripreneurs but also incubation and acceleration programs for youth-led agribusinesses. So essentially converting ideas into reality and then converting pilots into full-scale projects. Um, in terms of access to land and markets, we also do a lot of work around business to, building business-to-business -business linkages that enhance youth access to finance, markets, innovation, and so on. We are also building youth-to-youth -youth linkages by creating those mentoring opportunities um, for youth that have achieved some success, you know, in agriculture and agribusiness to pass on that knowledge to other young people and reduce the risk of failure, um, like I talked about earlier. And then finally, as far as our work with policymakers and governments is, 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 is concerned, you know, it's, it's, it sort of borders around lobbying for even basic amenities. In many parts of rural Africa, we still don't have stable electricity. And you can't have any realistic conversation about digitalization and digital agriculture without basic things like electricity. So there is sort of a push for, for, for um, the, the, the provision of these kinds of amenities for research and development, which Mr. Lohento talked about, and infrastructure, including roads. Uh, when you talk about access to markets, you know, most of the rural agricultural 
practitioners need a better way to access mainstream markets, whether it's in urban centers or peri-urban centers. And so we continue to sort of take this integrated approach because doing one thing and leaving the other um, sort of tends to limit the, the extent to which you can achieve impact. And so this is just supposed to be sort of an example of a model that perhaps other stakeholders on the call could, could, could embrace um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the efforts to foster increased youth participation in the sustainable agriculture agenda. And so I'll, I'll leave it here for now um, and also sort of happy to continue the conversation um, through the Q&A. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Wooley, for those interesting points. They were, they were really insightful. Uh, we will now move on to the questions and answers section. Uh, since we started a little bit late, we will extend the session a little bit more with additional 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I see that there are already questions in the Q&A module and some of them have been already answered. And we have two more questions. Uh, the, the, the first question is addressed to Mr. Ken Lohento uh, from Tamas Watai. Uh, the question is as follows. Are there any cases in, Af are there cases in Africa when telecommunication firms support the provision of digital climate smart agriculture services? If yes, could you provide some examples? Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Pina. So we have many um, uh, telecom operators that are providing those kind of services. And actually, if you consider numbers, uh, the, the, the most farmers I are rather rich uh, by telecom operator services. And in many cases, the telecom operators, they work with the government, even though they can also work with private sector. Now to give an, some example, um, in uh, Mali and, um, and Niger, uh, also Burkina Faso, I think the three countries um, were involved at some point in time, there has been a program called Garbal, which is a satellite-based information uh, for pastoralists um, and uh, Orange, which is uh, the originally the French uh, telecom operator that is also operating in Africa. They have worked with uh, the organization, the Dutch organization SNV to provide that service. So a consortium has been put in place so that um, the three uh, different institutions uh, can collaborate and deliver services to, um, to uh, pastoralists. We also have the case uh, of um, Ethio Telecom, so the telecom operator of um, Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, they have a platform that they called, um, I think it is uh, Help Desk 8028 which is uh, an advisory service platform, but is also, it can be considered as uh, a service that supports climate smart agriculture. And the service is offered with uh, the support of uh, the ETO Telecom, which is uh, the telecom operator and the Agricultural Transformation Agency of uh, Ethiopia. Basically the government is collaborating with them to deliver that service. And because telecom operators, generally they have millions of users in the databases, those who are all uh, their client receiving SMS service and the like, they can easily uh, reach out and reach uh, stakeholders, many stakeholders, million of stakeholders. So yes, in Africa, we have many platforms that are supported by uh, telecom operators and generally they collaborate with government or private sector for the delivery of those services. Over. Thank you so much, Mr. Lohento. Um, I will pass to the last question today because we are almost out of our time. Um, the second question is from Nixon Getcho. Uh, it is as follows. How do we ensure that we can create dignified jobs for youth using digital? Can you give examples? Maybe Mr. Wooley, uh, would, you like to, would you like to refer to that question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nixon, for the question. Um, I will use our OER program as a case in point. I think the starting point for creating dignified jobs for youth is to involve, is to sort of take a context specific approach when designing solutions, right? So ensuring that you're listening to youth voices or we are listening to youth voices when we design programs or interventions that are meant to create opportunities um, as far as employment and entrepreneurship um, go for young people. So in terms of creating these things, you, these opportunities using digital, within the OER program, we, we, um, what we've done and that has worked very well, especially in the COVID period, um, is to organize virtual incubation programs, actually hybrid incubation programs, 
um, that sort of, first of all, you know, allow us to be able to reach young people who are not in city centers, right? Um, so when you have these kinds of programs, young people in, in, a, in a city like Nairobi, you know, can obviously join physically, but in other counties like CIA might not be able to join physically. So taking this hybrid approach allows us to be able to rope in um, a larger number of young people and sort of bridge the digital divide. It's not a perfect solution because there are young people in parts of various countries that don't have access to stable internet, right? And for those um, situations, we do have on the ground um, delivery of, of technical assistance of, of trainings and capacity building programs um, that ensure that these solutions reach young people. And what are the solutions, right? So um, there are training programs and incubation programs that enable youth to understand business development, investment readiness, financial literacy, value addition, um, basically the essential elements to building a sustainable business. And building a sustainable business means you're also building a dignified business or, or getting a dignified job. And so this is probably one of uh, just one example of, of um, how we, we sort of um, leverage digital to, to create dignified jobs for, for young people in agriculture and agribusiness. I hope that answers the question, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Vuli. Um, we would like to thank you to all participants for their questions and comments. And now um, I would like to wrap up the session. Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates and participants and dear colleagues, today we have heard about the importance of technological change and digitalization for the sustainable agriculture agenda, particularly the solutions it can offer in the face of the contemporary challenges of our times. We have also heard the challenges associated with this transformation and how to address those challenges. I would like to express my gratitude to all the speakers who dedicated their valuable time to be with us today. Before concluding, in addition to what we had heard from our FAO colleagues on FAO's work in the area of digitalization, I would like to refer to one of the flagship reports produced each year by FAO, the SOFA, the State of Food and Agriculture. The 2022 edition, which is of relevance to today's topic and might be of relevance for future work in this area, looks at how automation, including the most recent digital technologies in our agri-food systems can contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals and offers recommendations to policymakers on how to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks. With case studies from all over the world, representing technologies at different stages of readiness and appropriate to agricultural pro producers of different scales and levels of income, the report investigates the drivers of these technologies and identifies several barriers preventing its adoption, particularly by small-scale producers. As highlighted in the foreword of the report by the FAO Director General, without technological progress and increased productivity, there is no possibility of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. And it must be ensured that the process takes place in a way that is inclusive and promotes sustainability. While concluding, I would like to express our gratitude to you participants for taking your time and joining the session of the FAO in Geneva Agriculture Trade Talks. I thank you all for your attendance. FAO in Geneva will continue to organize dialogues on the topics of agriculture and fisheries in collaboration with the Markets and Trade Division and the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division this year. We will be announcing the themes and dates for the upcoming series in due course. I wish you all a very good day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pina. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.